and for the reading of God's holy word. And our scripture reading this morning comes from John chapter 12. And I will be reading verses 37 through 50 from the New King James Version. If everyone is there, would you please say amen? Amen. But although he had done so many signs before them, they did not believe in him, that the word of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spoke. Lord, who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe, because Isaiah said again, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest they should see with their eyes, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn, so that I should heal them. These things Isaiah said when he saw his glory and spoke of him. Nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Then Jesus cried out and said, He who believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And he who sees me sees him who sent me. I have come as a light into the world, that whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. And if anyone hears my words and does not believe, I do not judge him, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me gave me a command, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his command is everlasting life. Therefore, whatever I speak, just as the Father has told me, so I speak. So then faith cometh by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. You may be seated. My subject for this morning is Jesus rejected and accepted as king. This is a clear picture of Jesus being rejected and accepted as king. And as he persistently does, John never allows his readers to avoid the decision about what to do with Jesus Christ. For those of you who are ready to respond to Jesus, no obstacle will keep you from belief. Amen. But for those whose hearts are hardened against Jesus, even the most compelling reasons for faith become obstacles. And John soberly reminds us that many of those who believe in Jesus still allow the pressures and fears of people to hinder their faith. Yes. Hidden faith may avoid confrontations with others, but it seldom pleases God. Amen. And in this section, Jesus mentioned three ways that we can use the light. Walk in the light. Put into action those lessons and commands that God allows you to see. Put your trust in the light. Confidently depend on Christ for your present and your future. And become children of light. Allow Christ to shine his light through you so that others might see the light. Amen. Verses 37 through 41 says... But although he had done so many signs before them, they did not believe in him, that the word of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled which he spoke. Lord, who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe because Isaiah said again, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest they should see with their eyes, lest they should understand with their heart, and turn so that I should heal them. These things Isaiah said when he saw his glory and spoke of him. This is about unbelief. It's about unbelievers who act illogically. 
and their unbelief makes absolutely no sense because God has done all he can to help us believe, yet we reject Christ, refusing to believe him. And people in Jesus' time, like those in the time of Isaiah, wouldn't believe either. Despite the evidence, and as a result, God hardened their hearts. But does this mean that God intentionally prevented these people from believing in him? And the answer, of course, is no. He simply confirmed their own choices. After a lifetime of resisting God, they had become so set in their ways that they wouldn't even try to understand Jesus' message. And for such people, it's virtually impossible to come to God because their hearts have been permanently hardened. And unbelief rejects signs. It rejects miracles and Jesus had done so many signs but the people still didn't believe him but I want you to notice three significant facts Jesus was deeply touched by the suffering of man Jesus reached out in a moving and loving compassion and Jesus helped and ministered to everyone he could possibly reach in fact Christ performed so many works and miracles that if they were written one by one, the world itself couldn't contain the books. And Jesus worked miracle after miracle, compassion after compassion, help after help, sign after sign, healing after healing. They were miracles of quality, miracles that arose from the heart of God himself. They were miracles of compassion and help. Miracles arising from a heart with a sincere motive. A heart that had been touched by the sufferings of humanity. And they were pure miracles and signs. Strong miracles. Miracles and signs that only God's power could do. And he did them before people. Jesus didn't do his works out in a desert. He didn't do his works far off in a corner in some obscure place out of sight where people couldn't see him. Jesus did his miracles, his signs before people. He did his signs where they could easily be seen and where the miracles would demonstrate his deity and help people to believe. But even while Jesus was ministering and demonstrating such enormous compassion and power, the people still didn't believe in him because their hearts were shut. Their hearts were closed to the clear and undeniable evidence that Jesus was truly the Son of God. They were in a state of unbelief and their unbelief was illogical. It was unreal reasonable, making no sense whatsoever. John chapter 15 verse 24 says, If I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would have no sin. But now they have seen and also hated both me and my father. Unbelief rejects revelation. But this fact is a fulfillment of prophecy. Isaiah 53 verse 1 says, Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Isaiah had proclaimed the report or the message of God, yet the people didn't believe. They rejected Isaiah's message and acted illogically, and their unbelief cut deeply and broke Isaiah's heart. You know what? I can relate to Isaiah because people reject God. This is their unbelief. But Isaiah was filled with compassion and hurt for the people. Isaiah cried out to God, who has believed our report? And the cry was the beginning of the greatest prophecy ever made about Jesus. Who has believed our report? And the report was from God himself. The report was God's message and revelation to the world. The report was both the words and deeds of Jesus. All that 
Jesus did through preaching and teaching revealed the truth. However, the report was more than words and deeds. Jesus himself was the report. Jesus himself was the revelation of God to the world. Amen. God has given us more than just words. He has given us more than just ink and paper. And he has given us more than just the sounds of a voice. God has given us a life to live out the words. He has given us a person to not only speak the truth, but to live the truth. He has given us a person to not only speak the works, but to do the works. He has given us a person to not only preach God's will, but to demonstrate God's will. God has given us a person to not only teach us, but to show us how to live. And the person, of course, was God's own son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Yet, despite the fact that God sent his own son into the world to proclaim his report or his revelation, people still don't believe. Amen. People still reject Jesus Christ. They still deny the report and they still act illogically making no sense whatsoever. Amen. John chapter 6 verses 63 through 64 says, It is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you who don't believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who would betray him. So God knows who believes and who won't believe. But notice what Jesus said. Jesus said there are some of you who don't believe. There are some who didn't accept Jesus' words. Therefore, they didn't have the Spirit of God abiding in them. And since they didn't have the Spirit of God abiding in them, neither did they have life. They were only existing. They weren't living abundantly and eternally because they didn't have the knowledge and the steady, unswerving assurance of living forever. They doubted and wondered, and they were always hoping they would live forever, but they were never quite sure because unbelief rejects the arm of the Lord. And this, too, is a fulfillment of the same prophecy in Isaiah 53, verse 1. And and the arm of the Lord means the strength of God. It means his power to save and deliver and to give life. But it can also mean the Savior and Deliverer himself. The arm that saves and gives life is Jesus Christ himself. Amen. But when it comes to God's strength to save and deliver, who knows it? When it comes to God's strength to save and deliver, who has experienced it. When it comes to God's strength to save and deliver, to whom has it been revealed? When it comes to God's strength to save and deliver, who has humbled himself so that God can reveal it? When it comes to God's strength to save and deliver, who has diligently sought him enough so that God can reveal it? Unbelief rejects the arm and salvation of the Lord. Unbelief rejects the strength of God and his power to save and to deliver and to give life. Very simply, unbelief rejects Jesus. It's illogical and it makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. Amen. John chapter 3 verse 36 says, He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. And he who does not believe in the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. I want you to notice a critical matter about unbelief. Because unbelief results in some serious consequences. And this passage says that God blinds and hardens you. Because you cannot reject Jesus Christ and expect matters to remain the same. And just for the record, it doesn't matter how mild your rejection is. It's still serious to God. 
You may reject Jesus in thought only and never say a word or ever commit a public visible sin against Jesus. But no matter how mild your rejection may be, God still can't overlook the rejection of his son. God loves his son too much and his son has done too much for us. His son has taken our sin upon himself and he bore the punishment for us. God's son died for us. Thus Jesus has done too much for God to bypass your unbelief and rejection. Amen. When you have the chance to see and open your heart and you choose not to look and you close your heart, Amen. you suffer the consequences. Amen. When God has loved the world and done so much for us, Amen. we can't deny God's son and not expect to suffer the consequences. Amen. And the consequences are terrible. They are an awful fate for anyone to suffer because God blinds the eyes of the unbeliever. He hardens the heart of the unbeliever. God condemns the unbeliever to be lost. He condemns the unbeliever to be unhealed and the unbeliever never sees the glory of the Lord. But here's the important question. Does this mean that God causes your unbelief and condemns you to be lost before you were ever born? And the answer, of course, is no. And scripture shouts a thousand times no. You're not lost apart from your will. And you're not lost against your will. You're lost only because you choose to be lost. You're lost because you choose to have nothing to do with God. What scripture teaches is that God has set certain laws in the universe. Laws within us and laws within nature. Laws which go into motion and take effect when we act. Mm. If you do something, certain things will happen. Yeah. If you do something else, then something else will happen. And scripture teaches that unbelief is governed by these laws. Yeah. For example, there's the law of sowing and reaping. Mm. If you sow unbelief, you reap unbelief. There's the law of measure. If you measure unbelief, then unbelief is measured back to you. Whatever you measure is what you receive. There's the law of seeking. If you seek, you find. And the harder you seek, the more you find. There's the law of willful hardness and impenitence. And impenitence means having or showing no respect or sorrow for your sin or misbehavior. And the more you harden yourself and refuse to repent, the harder and more impenitent you become, the less you care about what you've done. In fact, you can become so hardened that you never repent. You don't even think about repenting. Thus you store up wrath against yourself. Wow. The point is this. These laws are what we call the law of conditioning. Mm -hmm. The more you do something, the more you condition yourself to do that thing. And the more you do it, the more it becomes a habit. It's like smoking or anything else. And this is what the Bible is saying. If you harden your mind and heart to the truth, you become conditioned more and more against the truth. Your openness and sensitivity to Jesus Christ dwindles more and more, and it can dwindle so much that it's gone forever. Wow. Therefore, the more you reject Christ, the more you decrease your sensitivity and your chance of ever accepting Christ. What scripture teaches can be summarized under what might be called the law of judicial blindness and rejection. This simply means that if you choose to reject God's son, mm -hmm. you choose to be blind and to harden your heart. Right. Therefore, you're given over to a just punishment and you're justly blinded and hardened. You're conditioned more and more. You're led to a judicial blindness and rejection by God through obstinate unbelief constant sin and continued rejection. God's word plainly says that there are conditioning laws within us 
and within nature. And it's a fact that unbelievers have to live under these laws the same as believers. Because God can't play favorites. He can't yank unbelievers out from under the just and judicial laws of the universe and force them to believe, taking away their wills. God has to allow all people to live under the same laws and to make the choices of life day by day. And believers have made the choice to follow God's son. But unbelievers have made the choice not to follow God's son. And there can be no violation of their wills. Unbelievers have to be allowed to go on in their unbelief, hardening themselves under the just laws of God's will established in the universe. As Jesus Christ clearly said, the words of judgment are already spoken. They are set up as God's law and will within the universe. It's the law and will of God that Jesus Christ proclaimed and in the end time it will be his words that will judge us. But in spite of all the clear evidence that's presented, people still don't believe. And yet the arm of the Lord has been revealed to us in great power. But people still close their eyes to the truth. They've heard the message. They've heard the report. And they've seen the miracles, but they still won't believe. When a person begins to resist the light, something within that person begins to change. And he comes to the place where he can't believe. And so again, they're led to a judicial blindness. A blindness that God permits to come over their eyes and they don't take the truth seriously or when they don't take the truth seriously. And it's a serious thing to treat God's truth lightly because you could very well miss out on your opportunity to be saved. And scripture tells us to seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he's near. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Verses 42 to 43 says, Nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. There are the silent believers, and these were the chief rulers and leaders among the people, and there were many. They believed in Jesus. Mm -hmm. They realized that Jesus was who he claimed to be, the true Messiah. But they had one serious flaw. They were silent. Therefore, they failed in three critical areas. First, they failed to confess Christ. They just would not confess him. Matthew chapter 10 verses 32 to 33 says, Therefore, whoever confesses me before men... Him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Second, they failed because they feared loss. They feared they would be excommunicated. They feared they would be put out of the synagogue, the church. They feared they would lose their position, their job, and their security. They feared the loss of their profession, their livelihood, and they feared the loss of recognition, esteem, honor, and authority. Matthew chapter 16 verse 26 says, For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? There are two stages, two beings, and two existences to the same life. The life that exists on this earth Mm -hmm. and the life that will exist beyond this life. Once a person, a life is born into this world, Mm -hmm. he will exist forever. It's just a matter of where he goes after this world. Does he go to be with God Mm -hmm. or to be apart from God? No one can gain the whole world. But what if you could? Compare to your soul. Is it worth it? Because if you compare your soul to all the pleasure and wealth and power and fame, they are nothing. 
often. Third, they fail because they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. They love what they got from people. Acceptance, esteem, recognition, prestige, commendation, favor, honor, image, and glory. Would you really give your soul in exchange for the world? Wow. And yet people do it every day. Because when you love the praise of men mm -hmm. more than the praise of God, yeah. that's exactly what you're doing. Jesus. You're exchanging the praise of men for the world. You want the praise of men more than you want the praise of God. If you really believe in Jesus, you can't help but confess him. There's no way you could be silent, so confess him and boldly confess him. Amen. John chapter 5 verse 44 says, how can you believe who receive honor from one another and do not seek the honor that comes from the only God? Most people would rather be accepted by people and have their approval than to be accepted and approved by God. Verses 44 to 46 says, Then Jesus cried out and said, He who believes in me believes not in me but in him who sent me. And he who sees me sees him who sent me. I have come as a light into the world that whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. There's the true believer. Through believing in Jesus Christ, the mediator, you believe in God. And through seeing Jesus Christ, the mediator, you see God. You don't believe in God or Jesus. To believe in God, you must believe in Jesus. Amen. So it's not believing in God or Jesus. You have to believe in God in order to believe in Jesus. Amen. If you want to know what God is like, study the person and words of Jesus Christ. Amen. You believe in God. I mean truly believe in God only when you believe in Jesus Christ. Christ is the mediator. He's the bridge builder between God and man. First Timothy chapter 2 verse 5 says, For there is one God and one mediator between between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Therefore, if you want to approach God, you have to first believe in Jesus, the only true and living God. When you claim to believe in God apart from Christ, you're believing in a God of your own imagination. You're believing in a God of your own making. But when you believe in Christ, your faith is placed in God, the sovereign majesty of the universe, who sent Christ to save the world. John chapter 5 verse 24 says, Most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my word, and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment but has passed from death into life. Amen. You can only see God through seeing Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Christ claimed he who has seen me has seen the Father. When you look at Christ, you see the very nature of God. You see the very acts and words of God himself. Christ is the revelation of God who came to earth to reveal God. Therefore, when you see Jesus, you see God. Amen. And when you believe in Jesus, you've left Satan's dark kingdom and influence, and you've entered the light of God's kingdom. And yet, there are people in the church who act as though they still remain in darkness. But Jesus died so that we might be transformed. Therefore, if your life isn't changing, you may not have begun to realize follow the light because you're delivered from darkness only through Jesus Christ the light Amen. and Christ is the light of the world and Jesus made a great claim and a great promise the great claim was I am the light of the world mm -hmm. Jesus made the great claim of deity I am and the great promise was twofold he that follows me shall not walk in darkness, and he that follows me shall have the light of life. 
The point is this. You don't possess light, not within yourself, mm -hmm. not by nature, right. because by nature you're in darkness. Yeah. But when you follow Jesus, you're delivered out of darkness. And in order to receive light, following Jesus is a continuous action. Therefore, you must continue to follow Jesus. You don't stop. Jesus came to be the light of the world in order to bring light and salvation to us mankind. His very purpose on earth was to save us and to give us light. John chapter 8 verse 12 says, Then Jesus spoke to them again saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Christ came as a light into the world so that we won't have to live in a state of darkness. Thus when you believe in Christ, you are given light. You are given light to see and learn the truth of God. You are given light to see and learn the truth of yourself. You are given light to see and learn the truth of the world and others. And you are given light to see and learn the truth about the future and eternity. Verses 47 through 50 says, and if anyone hears my words and does not believe, I do not judge him, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me gave me a command, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his command is everlasting life. Therefore, whatever I speak, just as the Father has told me, so I speak. There is the unbeliever and his judgment. And Christ said two significant things. First, the unbeliever isn't judged by Christ because Christ came to save the world, not to judge it. And second, the unbeliever is judged by the words of salvation. The very words the unbeliever rejects are the very words that will stand as a witness against him. Wow. Because the unbeliever rejected the words of salvation, so his own words will be his judge. Wow. Here's what I want you to get. The unbeliever condemns himself because the words of salvation have been brought to earth by Jesus Christ. The full message of salvation is now available. No one is keeping you away from the words of salvation and no one is hiding the words of salvation from you. All you have to do is accept the words of salvation and then carry them to other people. But if you reject the words of salvation, you condemn and judge yourself. Wow. Why? Because in the last days when you stand before God the words of salvation won't be found in you. Because as an unbeliever the word, as an unbeliever the words will be outside you standing there to judge you. And there are three reasons why the words of Christ will judge you. First, the words of Christ will judge you because they are the very commandment of God himself. 1 sure. John chapter 3 verse 23 says, And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. Second, the words of Christ will judge you because God's commandment is life. John chapter 6 verse 63 says, It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words I speak to you are spirit and they are life. Third, the words of Christ will judge you because the words of Christ are the truth. They are the very words which the Father told Christ to say. John chapter 3 verse 34 says, For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God. For God does not give the Spirit by measure. Jesus closed his message with one final appeal. To accept the words he has spoken as having come from the Father. Because Jesus' words are God's commandment, because God's word is life, and because the words of Jesus are true. But you have to accept these words, and in accepting these words, you receive eternal life. Amen. So don't reject Jesus. Accept him. And accept him as king. 
and you will have eternal life. Jesus is the answer to everything that life is. Accept him. Make the decision about what you're going to do with Jesus and then think about how awesome it will be to spend eternity with him. Amen? Amen. Can we praise God for his holy and precious word?